record in the matter of People v. Scott Lee Peterson, case number SC0555-00A. If counsel would like to state their appearances, starting with counsel for Mr. Peterson. Good morning, Your Honor. Paula Mitchell, Los Angeles Innocence Project for Scott Peterson. Thank you. Good morning. And counsel for the people. Good morning, Your Honor. Attorney Vasquez, District Attorney, South Stanislaus County for the people. Good morning. Perfect Flatterer, District Attorney, South Stanislaus County for the people. Good morning. David Harris for the people. Good morning. I'm the right to speak to people, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning. And Mr. Peterson is present by Zoom. Mr. Peterson, can you both see and hear the proceedings? Yes, I can. Thank you, Your Honor. And do we have your consent to appear by Zoom this morning? Absolutely, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We are on this morning for the defense motion to seal. The motion to seal was directed at a single exhibit that was attached to the motion under Penal Code Section 1054.9, as well as the people's opposition to that motion to seal and the reply that was filed on behalf of Mr. Peterson. I'm prepared to hear our argument if all parties are ready to proceed. This was the defense motion. Ms. Mitchell, I will hear from the defense first. Thank you, Your Honor. The motion to seal that's before the court is pretty straightforward and simple. Mr. Peterson is seeking to keep private certain witness information that was obtained from police reports for all of the reasons stated in our pleadings. So unless the court has any questions for us, we're prepared to submit on our pleadings, and we would respectfully ask for an opportunity to respond to any arguments the prosecution may raise today. Okay. That's fine. You'll get an opportunity to reply. I guess the question that I have is every version of the exhibit, the one that was attached to your motion to seal and the one that was attached to the 1054.9 motion that is the target of the motion to seal, were filed with the court redacted. What is it exactly that you're seeking the court to seal since everything that is in the record already has the redactions that you're looking for? We're just asking for those redactions to be kept in place so that that information is not made public. Okay. Thank you. Comments by the people? Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. I'll be brief. First, there was some debate on our end as to what was actually being requested by the defense in their motion to seal. Was it to file under seal solely that November 14th letter requesting post-trial discovery that they sent to our office, or were they looking to seal more? So we had some debate amongst ourselves. And the reason for that is the language in their motion makes it unclear what they're asking for exactly because on page 4, line 21, they write, Defendant Scott Peterson is asking this court for permission to file certain information under seal and a redacted exhibit that is public-facing in support of his motion for post-conviction discovery. The motion further states the redactions cover personal identifiers of witnesses, potential suspects, individuals with knowledge of potential suspects, and other sensitive information related to counsel's investigation. This seems to suggest more than just the November 14th letter since both the motions and the multitude of exhibits attached to both motions contain redactions or admit information up to and including the point of having anonymous witnesses. Further, what we viewed as a potentially very vague and therefore expansive request also asked the court to permanently seal the items. This is evident in Mr. Harris' statement to the court when we were here last where he said, as of this hearing, and it remains true today, we don't know who these witnesses are. This includes DM, ST, KM, KW, TS, and KD, assuming I have those letters correct because some of the redactions were such that it was kind of hard to see the letters. So this remains our concern. In his reply, the defense attacks the prosecution at one point and essentially accuses the people of lying to this court about witnesses who have not been identified to the people. That was at page 2 of their reply on line 10. Yet it was, in fact, counsel who stated, the identity of the witnesses whose names are redacted in the declarations that Mr. Harris is referring to have stated they are fearful of retaliation by the Modesto Police Department if their names become known and have asked that their names remain sealed. That's at the transcript on page 15. We just wish to ensure that in responding to these motions with very lengthy attachments that we're able to address in a very fulsome way all of the various allegations being made in those documents. Further, as we've noted, they have requested redactions in that letter of 40 individuals and two addresses. Of those, 
10 individuals and two locations are actually identified in the defense filings uh, or their informal discovery requests. So a full 25% of those people, their names are already out there. Uh, almost immediately upon the time of their filing, all of those documents were published by the media. So the information is out there. Uh, it begs the question how serious they are about protecting the names of these people, given that, uh, at least outside of the people whom they only identify by initials. So there's a simple solution to that. Um, if the concern is sealing of that particular letter, um, the, that particular letter as an exhibit could be withdrawn from the motion. Uh, it does not add to their motion. It's not necessary to their motion. It largely provides the same information uh, as what is contained in their motions. And it also injects a lack of clarity since frequently what is suggested in the footnotes regarding what the content of the exhibits will be is not necessarily what is actually provided in the motion and the attached exhibits. And Let's bring in criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Brian Silber, who is standing by watching this hearing with us. Brian, it's good to see you. This is a situation where the defense, the L.A. Los Angeles Innocence Project, they want to file under seal anything's going forward that relates to potential witnesses. They uh, call them either potential suspects, possibly good Samaritans who came forward with information. What is the process for sealing? What does that look like that's different from how things are filed in court? anyway so it it sounds like we need a little bit more information about this particular circumstance but you have to understand we're dealing with public records and they're public for a very important reason we need transparency in our legal system uh, and that's something that protects uh, litigants it, it protects the public uh, it's you know it's a uh, protection against the government that they shouldn't conduct uh, criminal justice uh, proceedings in secret uh, however there are limited circumstances where certain things uh, are withheld from the public record and they get sealed or they get redacted. An example might be the full name of a minor. Uh, some of those initials may reference minors. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but that would be a reason. Uh, people's date of birth, social security, uh, anything that would be sensitive, uh, you know, you can motion the court uh, to uh, exclude from the record. Um, the bigger picture here, I don't know. I think it's yet to be seen. We need to hear the rest of the arguments. I love that you're sharing the reasons we typically would see things sealed, but in this situation, they're saying because it's so high profile and they want to protect these people from uh, intense scrutiny that they want this seal. Brian, stand by. We do have to squeeze in a break. We want to get everyone back inside for more of that hearing there in San Mateo County, California, in the case of Scott Peterson. Don't go anywhere. Now to the hearing for a convicted killer of his wife and his unborn son, Scott Peterson, 20 years later, is in front of a judge remotely today. The L.A. Innocence Project is representing him, and they're pushing to get him a new trial all these years later, saying that his rights were violated in that first trial. Let's go back in. So the defense's actions also speak to the seriousness of this motion. They now claim that the people are wrong, that the California Rules of Court 2.550 and 2.551 govern this motion to seal. That's in their reply at page four, line three. Um, when it was the defense that filed this motion in the first place, stating this motion is made pursuant to California Rules of Court 2.550 and 2.551. The defendant does admit, admit in his reply in a footnote that Mr. Peterson's motion to seal cited California Rule 2.550, 2.551, not that it was made pursuant to those sections. This sort of hit and run approach deprives the people of really understanding on what basis the defendant is claiming the legal right to seal anything. Instead they, of starting over, they just simply say, well, oops, and move on. Even under the defendant's new position, however, those rules are a good starting point. I would like to address one comment in defense's counsel, uh, defense counsel's motion.
that we have refused to provide any discovery to which they are entitled is the claim. And I'd just like to note that current counsel substituted in and replaced prior habeas counsel on the pending habeas on November 13th of 2023. The next day, they sent us an email with the 50 plus page um, letter at issue here, requesting literally hundreds of items the bulk of which had been either previously provided to prior counsel or no longer existed due to being affiliated with unrelated cases and the passage of 20 years, uh, or never existed in the first place um, because their existence is based on supposition and speculation. And in addition to that, there was a request for DNA testing. So this letter arrived the week before Thanksgiving and the Christmas holidays. Uh, on December 14th, we suggested a meeting with them in January. And on January 17th, we were served with the motions at issue here. We have continued to review the various requests in these very lengthy motions uh, as we work on our responses. This is an incredibly time consuming process. Uh, and, and this is not the first time that the defense has brought such motions. He's previously brought both a 1405 and a 1054.9 motion. So in sum, um, our suggestion is simply to withdraw that letter from the discovery motion. Then no sealing discussion is even required. Uh, two, we don't believe the defense has established good cause by substantive evidence for their request because there's no substantive evidence included. Um, but the fact of the matter is, Your Honor, we don't really have a concern with having the pleading documents have initials for these citizens who have not been previously identified because we know, we know who they are. Um, we do, however, request full disclosure of the unnamed witnesses who we have no idea who they are. Uh, and having said that, just in, the last thing is when we're done with this portion, I have discussed with Ms. Mitchell a motion um, that we're going to be filing for judicial notice and something we'd like to file. And we've already given her a copy of the CD and it's the complete reporter's, uh, reporter's transcript with an index. So. Okay. All right. So let's stick with the motion to seal and then I will take up that uh, discussion that you just referenced. Um, Ms. Mitchell, your reply to the people's comments. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Peterson has two objectives. One is to get the discovery and the DNA testing that we're requesting as soon as we possibly can. The second objective is to protect the integrity of our investigation that is ongoing. The uh, motion to seal, um, I did not expect it would become uh, this convoluted. I agree with Ms. Vladiger that it makes sense to withdraw the exhibit at this point. We don't need it. We're entitled to our um, discovery without it. So to simplify things and keep things moving forward, hopefully expeditiously, we, we will withdraw that at this time. Okay, that's fine. Uh, the court will direct uh, that the exhibit be returned to counsel and uh, it won't be uh, considered as part of the motion. Um, and that moots the ceiling uh, request. So. There's no need for the court to rule on that. In terms of the uh, comments about judicial notice, um, what was the motion that you, what, what was the discussion that you and Ms. Mitchell had about dealing with that today, and what is the proposal, Ms. Vladimir? So, Your Honor, uh, we both referenced in our various pleadings that we'll, um, to start with, with just today, we, and I've, I've given Ms. Mitchell a copy, we have a motion um, for the court to take judicial notice of the entire reporter's transcript. We have included a CD that has the entire reporter's transcript on it, including an index, so it is much easier for court and counsel to go exactly where they need to go with, with a, um, a citation. Uh, we discovered during the, this process that our reporter's transcript doesn't coincide with the defense's reporter's transcript, which is a, a problem uh, in terms of citations. And so we're trying to address that issue now, early, um, and make sure we're all citing to the same transcript. Uh, we will at a later time, I think with the filing of our motion next Monday, 
uh, also be requesting additional, additional judicial notice, and we will include at that time additional CDs, and that includes the, some of the very documents the defense has requested as well, such as the new trial motion, California Supreme Court opinion, petition for habeas, and a variety of other documents. We'll put them all in one CD. Okay. So what is the proposal for today? Are you essentially just previewing that that's coming, and are we trying to set uh, some kind of a filing schedule for the request for judicial notice in case there's uh, either opposition or a difference between what the people are asking for judicial notice of and what the defense is seeking judicial notice of? Well, if, if, if Ms. Mitchell is in agreement, we'd like to go ahead and submit this motion to the court today. I don't believe she has an opposition to it. If we get the, the disc in the hands of the court that much more quickly. Okay. Ms. Mitchell, comments by the defense? Uh, I haven't had an opportunity to look at this yet. I would like to review it and compare it with our copy of the record and make sure I understand what the differences are. Um, but I don't foresee any objection. I just would like an opportunity to review it first. Okay. That's fine. It, so if Ms. Flattiger... All right, we're going to hit the pause button because we do have to get to a break. But you heard there, it sounded like the defense counsel for Peterson says at this time they're going to withdraw that motion to seal those witnesses because they don't need this exhibit, but certainly still a concern for them. They want these witnesses who are unnamed to not be hesitant to come forward with information. Don't go anywhere. This is Court TV Live. Tonight on Closing Arguments, a deep dive into today's gripping testimony in the trial of Chad Daybell. The self-proclaimed doomsday prophet is charged in the murders of his previous wife and his current wife's children. We'll bring you the key moments you may have missed as our experts weigh in. And could Scott Peterson be exonerated for the murders of his wife Lacey and his unborn son Connor? We have the latest from today's hearing with insight from our think tank. Closing Arguments, tonight at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. Welcome back to Court TV Live. The Los Angeles Innocence Project is arguing for a new trial this afternoon for convicted wife killer Scott Peterson. They say new evidence in this case that dates back to 2002 that it could prove his innocence. He's been behind bars ever since. Let's go back into this hearing that's unfolding now. Yes, Your Honor, one additional thing. Um, in the, the record, there are, or in the pleadings, there are citations to exhibits. Yes. And people will be citing to numerous exhibits as well. Uh, our understanding, those are exhibits are currently in Modesto. So that's going to create an issue for this court to be able to see those. So what we're attempting to do is either photograph or use from the clerk transcript on appeal, copied versions of some of those particular exhibits. Uh, we would like to save the court and your clerks the time of trying to figure out how to take an exhibit that already exists and with a new exhibit and giving it a new number and so on and so forth. Is uh, Again, if it would be agreeable with Ms. Mitchell, what we'd like to do is those particular exhibits, we will keep the same numbers from the trial. We will identify them as trial exhibits with those particular numbers. If they are uh, a document, we will attach the document. We will take photographs of the exhibits as they have done with their motion, for example, on the boat cover. Um, we will put all of those onto one particular disc, and we would like to, again, lodge those with the court because I don't think the court or the clerks wants to file duplicates of what's already in the court record. Um, but And some of them may be under seal that we uh, are asking the court to deal with based on, for example, some of the autopsy pictures. The other thing that would be a potential issue in the defense's pleadings, they had referred to certain bait stamps, as we refer to them, police report pages. Mm -hmm. We will be having those citations as well. Those are not part of the trial transcript, but they may have some of the same type of information if it was a tip page, where there would be information that would need to be redacted. Um, again, what our intention is that we will identify them by bait stamp page number. And we will have a separate disc for those particular items. So we'll have one that's the court, court exhibits, one that will be something that refers to prior discovery, and we will attach those as part of uh, the procedural attachments to our particular responses to the next two motions. Okay, 
So essentially what you're asking is to whether or not, uh, Ms. Mitchell, are you going to have any objection to either the procedure or the nomenclature for exhibits that's proposed by the people in their filing of responses? Is the prosecution planning to, to include all of the exhibits, everything from trial, everything, everything? It's not our intention, but when we specifically cite to one, we are going to provide it to the court. So it's either we ask the clerks to obtain it from Modesto and bring it to the court, um, which might be difficult in some cases, or we attach the photograph like they did to theirs. So we think that's the easiest for the specific exhibits that we are going to use. If the defense wants us to include some, we could add those to the disks as well if they'd identify them for us. Okay, so bottom line, what you're proposing, Mr. Harris, is that when you file your responses to the pending motions, either the trial exhibit or photographs, you want the, the numbering conventions for those exhibits to remain consistent with the trial to save duplication of effort. You're willing to meet and confer with the defense to include in the materials that are provided to the court with trial exhibits anything that they might be citing to. Uh, is that, am I correctly stating your position? Yes, that's acceptable to the people. And Ms. Mitchell? No objection. Okay, that is fine. Uh, to the extent that you believe that it is necessary to file any of those things under seal uh, or lodge them and seek uh, court permission to file under seal, uh, that will require a separate motion. I can't do that by stipulation. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the process that we went through today, uh, it 2.550A3 seems pretty clearly to exempt things that are lodged in a discovery motion and in connection with the adjudication of a discovery motion uh, from the procedural requirements of 2.550. So. Your Honor, one additional thing. Sure. Uh, some of the exhibits, uh, actually, if the court has looked at the exhibit index, the court will note that there are an extensive amount of items that are sealed currently. Okay. So we, okay, technically, we could provide those to the court. They are already in a sealed condition. There's never been an order lifting those seals from any of the courts that have reviewed. So I think the court could just... If the court was to go downstairs and look in the exhibit room at something that's already sealed, mm -hmm. we provide it to the court not filing it so that it does not become a new public record, so to speak. It would just be something that the court has under seal already. I mean, if, it's, if there is already an order sealing that exhibit and you're providing essentially a duplicate copy or a photograph, I don't think there's any barrier under 2.550 to filing it under seal because you have a sealing order. Yes. Yeah, that's fine. Since we can confer with counsel or see what she indicates is the bait stamp pages as they included them in their pleadings it was more of sometimes cut and paste or attachments for example the tip sheets as i mentioned there are a lot of tips on there which has information from other individuals that's irrelevant to what we'd be offering so we would um, put those bait pages in redact except for the tip that we would be referring to or whatever information we we're referring to and identify it by the base page number and attach that as a separate disk so we can deal with that one separate and apart from what's already previously been admitted in court. Okay. Any thoughts on that, Ms. Mitchell? No objection. Okay. That's fine. All right. Uh, is there anything else from either side before we uh, recess for the after for the day? Okay. Thank you all. Have a good day. That will conclude this hearing.